Good evening. You are listening to a Rattle Gym Broadcasting Premier Podcast TV Party Tonight. I'm your host, the man, data reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattle Gym tonight. Some say this is our favorite show, but I beg to differ. <laughs> we are reviewing WrestleMania Nights 1 and 2 because Christian, Christian, mm. Christian, Christian, Christian. <laughs> it's too big for just one night. It's the only one ever that's too big for one night. I I I, I, I am so excited. I am beyond excited. I I am just prickling with anticipation here. This is going to be one hell of a show. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You can hear our audience is the same as the audience they had. You know, I I know you don't follow the UFC, but uh, I had t- I talked to Larry Zonka four one mania dot com about mm-hmm. the WWE, and I said it feels like the WWE and the UFC are in a contest to be who could be more tone deaf. <laughs> it's because they because uh, what uh, both uh, Vince and Dana White were part of that conference call with the president a few days ago about uh, about sporting events and whatnot, right? Uh, they may have been that I wasn't aware of, but okay. I mean, the argument. Let me ask you a question: If you are sure. running, if you're running the WWE and you're told basically in like the middle of March, hey, the CDC is basically saying no gatherings of more than ten people. <clears throat> There's going to be a lot of shelter-in-place orders coming. This pandemic is on the rise. This isn't going to get any better by the end of March, beginning of April. Do you cancel WrestleMania when you know that... Because here's the thing. Mm-hmm. They are contractually obligated to continue to provide X amount of television for... USA and Fox. And... USA and Fox, right. Yeah. So if they're not... Now, I don't know how much of their contract says it has to be first-run stuff. Um, I mean, it, did you watch any of the Raws leading up to this? Yes. Yes, I did. So, you know, they yeah. would show, like, a match or two, and then they would show an old match. Sure. It would kill time, for right. sure. Yeah. So, I don't know how much of their contract says that the hours of TV they show have to be first-run and how much of it can be replay of stuff. And I'm um, not sure what what the rules would even be. I mean, this is we're living in unprecedented times right now. There sure. there are there are no sort of protocol on the book for this sort of a situation. So, I don't know that. I mean, if USA or Fox were to uh, you know have any clapback for repeats, I'm sure they'd get a lot of heat for it. Uh, you know, because the the top priority on everybody's mind now is is health and safety and. Uh, to put people out uh, for the sake of entertainment when, you know, they might not, they might not feel it, you know, or might not uh, be with it at that point. That would kind of make heels out of the networks, but, and, and probably hurt things moving forward. That said though, um, you know, the performance center, the things that they're doing there is like the, maybe the lessest of all the evils. Uh, It still (laughs) kind of sucks. Um, as for canceling Mania, I would, you know, if they had to have a show uh, this past weekend, make it something that isn't WrestleMania. Um, just uh, maybe, just do some sort of feel good sort of show, right? Just to, uh, just to, you know, because that, that's the whole premise. Though everything is a, uh, everything they that they're putting forward here is predicated on, you know, we're, we're going to take you away from real life. We're going to put smiles on your faces. So yeah, do that. Do that. That's cool. You know, give us something fun. Give us something wacky. Don't don't give us WrestleMania in, in an empty room. Yeah, I, I and I largely agree with you. I think like, and we'll talk about these in, in turn. But the Boneyard match, the Firefly Funhouse, the uh, Edge Randy Orton nine hour brawl through the Performance Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if you, I think if they had said we're not going to do WrestleMania, however, we're going to do you know WWE in your you know, in your house. Mm-hmm. And I only say that because 
Because we're all locked down. <laughs> yeah, well, that. Um, well, somebody made like a t shirt and it says WrestleMania and then they put the In Your House logo on it. That's funny. Yeah, I actually bought one of those. I was like, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, you know, we talk about the idea of like the glorified house show. Instead of doing a four hour WrestleMania and lying to people and saying it's too big for one night, and that's the thing that gets me, and that's kind of what I was getting to. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Only North Korea can deliver that kind of propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard. And I know I'm a cynical bastard, but it is hard for me to sit there and watch Byron Saxton and Tom Phillips, Lorelko, Schmageggy, Hassenpfeffer, <laughs> whatever his name is, look straight into the camera and go, WrestleMania? It's too big for more for just one night, and like the little oh, yeah. shine of the tooth. I, I can't. Not you know cool. you're lying. We know you're lying. It's, like it, there was nothing genuine about it. Though. No. They, they, uh, like Stephanie McMahon delivered like a thirty second piece before each one, where it, it was the same sort of glorification of the event. And uh, <laughs> Jim Cornette no. was like, "There's like the <laughs> Stephanie gave a promo where she said we're doing you a favor by throwing this event. Now sit down, shut up, and watch." Basically, basically, yes, he, he's he's right on there. It's a, uh, it, it was so disingenuous. Um, I didn't mind the Stephanie thing. I mean, it just it just felt like it felt like they were really, it, like they were protesting too much. It was just another yeah. layer on on the uh, you know the shit Sunday or the shit sandwich where a, a little too much padding on the back. Yes, yes, that too. And uh, you know, one thing that I'd never thought of, and I, I mentioned this uh, offline when we were talking, uh, and Bailey brought this up, who will be joining us, uh, uh, you know, soon. He said that because uh, I asked why they split it up for two nights, and it was either you or Bailey who said that this way they could count the viewers twice and tout <laughs> and tout that this is the most you know highest watched WrestleMania, and it's like wow. You know, because it makes so much sense. It's totally something that we could see them doing with the spin. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, this is nuts. <laughs> yeah. I, well, the reality is, I think it would be hard to sit in front of a TV and watch empty arena matches for seven or eight hours. And oh, like boy. I said, w whether you like the Boneyard match or not, whether you like the Firefly Fun, ha fun House, I think if they had done... I, I actually joked that... Um, you know, if Becky Lynch was going to show up in a truck, they just should have fought in like a ring of trucks. Why not? Uh, yeah. yeah, be like, creative about it. it. You know, you work within the limitations that you have, and uh, the Boneyard match and the Firefly Funhouse match that we'll talk about uh, later on. It's it was different. It was right. using it was using what they had, right. and uh, I and can't tell you how even, static and boring empty arena matches are. Oh, for sure. And even if you like, because uh, I, I think we're on the same mind with the uh, the Boneyard and the Firefly Funhouse match. I, I think we both like them a lot. Yeah. But even if people didn't like it, it's not just a failure, but it's an earnest failure. They were trying something new that right. just didn't work for you. Not for a lack of trying, because they actually did. They put production into this. They're working within the constraints that you know nature gave them, you know, or right. whatever it was. And uh, you could tell that there was a, there was that you know heart was there. There was heart in there. There was effort. And uh, it, whether or not you liked it, you have to at least respect the fact that they tried something new. I wanted to see the triangle ladder match on a construction site. Why not? Right? <laughs> I mean, and, and what they? I think you know. And this is this is something here. You mentioned the static and just the dead, empty arena. I think they should have offered two feeds for the show. I think they should have offered one where it was, you know, plain, static, no sound. And then maybe offered one where there was piped-in crowd noise. Yeah, Just no. as an option, you know, uh, if you want it, if you don't, whatever. These things were taped already. You can actually, they could actually make the crowd react the way they're supposed to. You know, I these wanted, weren't live shows. I wanted Stephanie McMahon to do a voiceover as the, as the show began. <laughs> WrestleMania, WrestleMania was taped in front of a live studio <laughs> audience. And like, throw canned laughter in there, do oohs and ahs. You know. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, have fun with it. At least right. do something that isn't... Because, uh, you know, I... I and I, I know we'll probably talk more about this as we go, but if you ever wanted to make your larger-than-life characters seem so small, this was how to do it. Yeah. I don't think this did um, 
Drew McIntyre any favors. Didn't do anybody a single favor except yeah. for the one, except for the people who were lucky enough not to have a match in that ring. If anything, it showed how a lot of them, you know, and I, I've complained about this with the WWE before, where it's replaceable parts, sure. um, sanitized, uh, paint by numbers wrestling. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, Chris Jericho talks about the, you know, the written promos and how everyone's promo to death and, you know, you're not allowed to be, be creative sure. you know, unless you're special. Mm-hmm. But even then, you know, you're, you're still somewhat scripted. The other thing that this really showcased was how they are all, you know, Larry Zonka said you can't untrain the robots. So you have like Nikki Cross, for example. Mm-hmm. Who's still playing to a crowd that isn't there? Uh, you know, I was going to say that because it feels like if you were to – I haven't played one of the WWE video games in like 10 years. But uh, I figure you could probably turn one on and watch somebody come to the ring. And that's exactly what we got here. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't matter if there's crowd. doesn't matter if there's no crowd. They just go through the motions. And uh, and, and it, these are the monsters that the, the performance center has created. It's right. – uh, why, and, were, there, and I why don't... were there chairs? Why were there barricades? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and if you have watched all the Rose and Smackdowns leading up to this, why do they come out to the stage to give the promo? Yeah. Why, why do they do that? Why don't they just deliver the promo on the back? It, it, there, there's no purpose for it. I used to love it, when I was a kid, you know, Brutus the Barber Beefcake would give a promo in front of a banner. Like a green screen, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that I had his gimmick on it. Sure. Um... You know, or they would do like the snake pit, but the snake pit wasn't in the ring. You know, Piper's pit wasn't in the ring; it was somewhere backstage. No, sure. and, yeah, and there was like a background that they would throw up, and then mm-hmm. Jimmy Snooker would fall into it. Yeah, um, <laughs> so it's a diorama they built. Yeah, <laughs> um, the funeral parlor, the same thing. These mm-hmm. were all on stages somewhere. Like, stop drawing attention to the fact that you're in an empty arena. And I think that you know, it's funny. On the one hand, clearly they showed if they put time and effort into it, they are capable of doing something really creative and out of the box. Sure. And look, for people like Jim Cornette or whatever, you know, the stagey cinematic matches may not have worked. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you have to, you know, nothing made wrestling look more fake than, as he called them, training school matches in front of no crowd. It's true. It's true. Because it's... uh... I mean, we're going to get into this as we go, but I mean, you, we heard we heard spots being called because, right. because oh these are... I've never wanted wrestlers to stop talking in any matter. Like oh, the constant yeah. like goading and, the, and chiding and the and trash and... talk. Anybody who delivered trash forever. talk, yeah, it's the only one that could that actually made it work was Oscar. She was the only one that made the trash talk work. <laughs> Everyone else was just like it was cringe city. Yeah, and it was uh, it really showed. It really showed a lack of uh, just a broad, you know, broad talent. You know, it really showed that, that how reliant they are on the crowds and, and just the, the routine. The Rhea Ripley-Charlotte match, they scream so much, I've heard porn with less yelling. <laughs> we were saying that about the, t- the women's tag match. It's like, I hope my wife doesn't, like, like put her ear up against the wall and hear me listening to this because... It's like screams and grunts and growls and and oh uh, and oh boy. Yeah, it's it's like a German Scheiser video. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it was not that is, I've watched that it? sort of thing. Pull no, no, no. Visible collar. Um, well, what was uh, what was that? Steffi Graf, the tennis player, who would uh, would like give the big ah. Uh, uh, every time. She... God. <laughs> All right. Um. Eventually, Mr. Bailey will. Uh, okay. I He's see a few there. minutes out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I see it now, and that was literally like three minutes ago. Um, <laughs> Any second. All right. Um, so let's get into night one here, or we'll sure. be here all night. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, let me just close, closing up my initial point. Oh, certainly. So yeah, the dis- it's the disingenuousness of the WWE that drives me away as a fan. Because I can tolerate a lot of the staginess, the overproduced matches, and you know, and the promos. Um, 
I mean, some of it is, as Lewis Black said, at this point, it's a religion. For me, it's just something I've done since I was six, seven years old. Sure. Um, it's hard to, you know, I, my interest in wrestling kind of ebbs and flows. It wanes here and there, especially with the WWE, but I don't stray too far from it. Um, and, I, and I just sort of tolerate, you know, warts and all. We know what we're getting into, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's when they're sitting there yelling into my face, it's too big for one night where I'm just like, just stop. Like, if mm-hmm. you had earnestly put together, like, a two-hour, one-night show of, here's some taped matches, here's some stuff we had some fun with. It's not WrestleMania, but, you know, we we wanted to do something. We're doing our best, yeah. But life sucks right now. You know, here's our rendition of some random artist playing his guitar on Skype. Sure. It's <laughs> true. Yeah, because the fact is they, they, uh, they're pretending nothing's wrong. Right. And uh, they're not even allowed to say the C word. You know, they're not allowed yeah. to even ad- address right. the elephant in the world right this now. This is the company and... where Vince McMahon said, I know that our audience is tired of having its intelligence insulted. Good guys versus bad guys. Well, did you forget that? Because you're insulting my intelligence. But I'll tell you <laughs> what, the WWE is a class act by, by comparison to the UFC that just scheduled an event. Can you believe that? With people? Uh, they're doing it, I think, on a private island. <laughs> <laughs> and so they can't get the one guy who's the current lightweight champion, uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov, because he can't get out of Russia. So they're doing oh, an boy. interim title fight because that's that's the UFC's thing. Like, can't, can't make the fight we want? We'll just make a fake belt. So now it's Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje uh, on April 18th. On Dana White's island. <laughs> yeah, on Dana White's fantasy <laughs> island. Good grief. Deep plane, deep plane. <laughs> oh, Lord. I hope they do it that way. I really hope this is called oh, that'd UFC's be nuts. fantasy. I'd watch that. Yeah, yeah. If, I'd watch the intro at least. Um, get, get Hornswoggle in there to, to point to an airplane, yeah. Oh, it'd be so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm. Um, with that said, uh, the, dar- the, the prelim match on night one, was Cesaro versus Drew Gulak. Um, you know, I don't want to keep drawing attention to the fact that there was no crowd. We've we, we've talked about it. There's nothing really more that, you know, so in some cases it was more pronounced than others. This sure. was fine. These two guys had a, a good, solid, strong style type wrestling match. Uh, Drew Gulak was a guy from Evolve who, when I saw him in Tampa, I thought... Oh, this is guy who's WWE ready, and lo and behold, he showed up in the Cruiserweight Classic, and mm-hmm. for a while was the Cruiserweight Champion. And Cesaro is breaking necks and cashing checks. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of Cesaro versus Drew Gulak? Good match, but uh, it, it was uh, you know, it's like if you are going to start the show with a uh, with an empty crowd there, I mean, you got to do something like I think. Maybe a little hot to to kick things off to get you really like going and ready to do this. And uh, as much as I love both of these guys, it just it 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 did a disservice to both of them. I feel because um, it was just a heatless sort of a thing. Um, and, and and you know, going back to the disingenuousness of the announcers here, they they couldn't they couldn't sell you know umbrellas in a rainstorm. <laughs> uh, the the announcers here, it was just. No energy. Um, somebody, and for some reason, they somebody kept made a the point of on. saying they sound like they were calling golf. That's a good. That's an apt uh, comparison. Because uh, they, for whatever reason, you know, just the the routine of WWE, the sanitized routine of WWE. They know that they have to put the cameras on the announcers every once in a while because it's just what they do every damn show, without exception. But even now, and they went to like JBL and Cole, and they looked like they were asleep. <laughs> It's like you can't, like we gave TNA shit when they get when they went over to TNA and Don West and they're reading from a script, but here I mean this is supposed to be the you know the showcase of the Immortals and Michael Cole has like one eye shut. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that the WWE does well with like change. They're not <laughs> flexible. They're no. not flexible at all. Um, so when life throws them a curveball, they just they, business they don't... as usual. Yeah, they don't change their swing at all. No, certainly and then, not. 
they miss the ball more often than they hit it. Um, all right, our show started proper with Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. I think Alexa Bliss did a better job of not playing to an empty crowd. Nikki Cross yeah. is a fucking robot. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because to the point uh, you that know, I'm we... like questioning her intelligence. Sure. Now. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe she sees people out there. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't think she's insane. I just think she's like rock stupid. Yeah, you know, she she is not flexible. She was not able to pivot. It was ju- it was just as though there were eighty thousand people there to her. It was the, the act was the act was uh, not great. Does she have an anxiety disorder? Like is she just like backstage going, okay, play to the crowd, hit my mark, da-da, 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 da-da. like the, fuck, hit your mark. <laughs> There's nothing that you're marked to. Rel- <laughs> Adapt. And yeah. she's like, no, no. Vince McMahon says, <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> Business as usual. Yeah. You know, the and, and it's funny because I've seen her on SmackDown a couple of times, and she does the same thing where it's like it's the same deal. Yeah. Yeah. She she yells like, "Come on!" to nobody. Yeah, it's like she's stomping her foot when she, you know, when she was the uh, when when Alexa was the face in peril, she's stomping her foot on the on the the, the apron like like there's going to be like fans clapping along. Yes, yeah. very very bad. Um, like Oscar and Kyrie were able to they were kind of able to adapt in not addressing the crowd but actually addressing their opponents. Right. You know, they were just shouting at the opponents, not pandering to a crowd, not posing on the turnbuckles, not, you know, or maybe just posing at the camera because the camera is there. But, uh, yeah, Oscar's fantastic. I mean, Kyrie oh, Sane. Best in the best in the league. Yeah. <clears throat> Kyrie Sane uh, came out in her stripper pirate outfit. Um, yes. And it only made me like that much more upset that all of this has happened. And we couldn't sure. get Kyrie Sane coming out of the pirate ship at uh, Raymond James Stadium. That's that's another. I'm glad you mentioned that because it feels like a lot of the uh, a lot of the performers were wearing their you know special WrestleMania gear that they yeah. ordered months ago. And uh, wow, that was sad. Yeah, you know, as we'll talk about Rhea later on, but uh, you could <laughs> tell that was her that was her WrestleMania gear, and uh, ain't nobody seeing it in person. No, it's so. Like, clearly she was meant to, you know, do something with the pirate ship or she wouldn't have been wearing the pirate gear. And then, you know, and so, of course, it's flat as fuck, you know, and she just walks out, you know, and and now she, like I said, now she just looks like a Mardi Gras stripper. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) I know they, to the the WWE's credit, and I have to say something positive Mm -hmm. here, from what I understand, like, they tape these over a series of weeks and days, so mm-hmm. as not to keep everybody around each other. And I think after every match, they sprayed the ring down and everything. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if they were testing people to the to the degree that they could. They might have been taking temperatures. <laughs> Did you ever watch <laughs> Deep Space Nine? No. Okay. Just, I made this joke on Larry's podcast, but for the sake of our audience, mm-hmm. uh, there's a scene in Deep Space Nine where they are in fear of being infiltrated by shapeshifters. And so, of course, you know, the only way to know if you're a shapeshifter is to draw blood, because obviously if you bleed, you're not a shapeshifter. Make sense? Okay. I'm with you. So you have these two Star Trek officials and I think a Klingon, and, you know, like they're meeting on how to deal with the, the, they're called the Dominion. And and the Klingon goes, before anything gets started, let's make sure we are all who we say we are. And like everyone has to cut their hand. That's what I feel like (laughs) is going on with temperatures now. (laughs) That's true. Um, see, if you didn't hear me on the 411 on Wrestling Podcast, you get to hear the same jokes here. There you go. <laughs> um, so other than sort of the minor nitpicks with uh, the inability to adapt in your mm. current surroundings, I thought Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross did an okay job. Um, sure. You know, Asuka is a fantastic wrestler. It's, you know, it takes a lot for me to really criticize her. Kari saying, I just glad she didn't injure herself. It was fine. It was an enjoyable match to get things started. Um, I don't feel like matches in this environment should go over 10 minutes. This one went 15.05. It's probably too long. It overstayed its welcome, yes. It did. And uh, I, I wasn't a fan of the result, but uh, <laughs> but I understand you know, trying to kick the show off with, uh, with a title change uh, and all that. But uh, yeah, it definitely did overstay its welcome, and and a lot of the matches we're going to discuss did the same. Oh 
Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, we took a pause for the cause, but joining us now is the other Posman, Mr. Chris Bailey from uh, up on Yoth Yonder. How are you, sir? <laughs> I am wonderful, sir, and I'm ready to talk some uh, some sort of WrestleMania talk here. So uh, I'm right in the midst of Corbin and Elias. How lucky am I? Yes, Ooh, boy. We brought you right on time to talk about the feud of the century, the hippie drifter, <laughs> the hipster drifter versus the possum king. It's like you broke a chain letter. <laughs> the possum king. He I, is like he's like, he's like a background reject for uh, Game of Thrones. This Corbin, this King Corbin character. I uh, I totally stole the possum king thing from Jim Cornette. Um, I love it. <laughs> stealing liber liberally from people funnier than I am. Um. All right. So Elias versus King Corbin. I mean, these guys are not known for the great feats of athleticism. Elias. For the longest time, like, all he did was play silly songs and get beat up. And I guess for loyalty to the company and his ability to take endless beatings, now he's a face on SmackDown. And they needed somebody for King Corbin to, to play off of. And, you know, the, the Drifter character is a kind of a fun one to take apart. You know, especially for all the stuff Elias has been through. Um... I miss when I've said this before. I miss when King Corbin used to just deep six people like in you know in three minutes. And that yes, was absolutely. Yeah. So that NXT character is long gone, man. But uh, I don't know if there's anyone more stale than Elias right now. It just seems like there's this overwhelming crust of boredom around him. I don't know what it is, but uh, Corbin, despite being you know uh, <laughs> as you call him the Possum King. There's always something semi-charming about this guy that no matter how much I hate his guts coming out and I hate the look of his face and, you know, he's just one of these guys that turns your stomach. But at the end of the day, he always seems to pull something entertaining out. But I do miss NXT, Corbin, for sure. Um, these two had a match, and your mileage may vary. I mean, neither one of them are going to do anything particularly interesting in the ring. So it becomes, you know, a matter of how vicious, how brutal the match is going to be. This was fine. It was relatively short. It was <clears throat> it was nine minutes. It was less than ten. I, before you came on, I said, on average, these should have been ten minutes or less. More than that becomes... You're risking really exposing what uh, just how bad the situation is when they have no audience. Um, what did you think of it, Sheehan? Well, you know, we started off with the word that uh, Elias wasn't going to show up. You know, because he got thrown off the balcony onto a nice fluffy cushion that made a whoof sound. <laughs> um, and, and they played that clip over and over and over again every single time. Woof. But uh, we get the, you know, the, you know, the, he's, he can't show up, so we got to forfeit the match. And then we're expecting something, right? We're expecting something surprising, something, you know, to, to maybe pop us a little bit. And Elias walks out. And it's just like, well, that deflated the whole... If there was anybody in the room, it would have deflated it. And uh, I, I really did not care for this match. And honestly, I couldn't tell you who won it. Who won it? Elias won with a roll-up. Okay. Oh, that's my favorite finishing hold. Um, yeah, I, I... It was just a match that, uh, even though it went under 10 minutes, it felt like it, uh, it overstayed by about five or six. Pat Oswalt talks about a damn Yankees video that features Ted Nugent where um, they were deflecting bullets with the power of rock. Okay. That's, what, <laughs> that's what I needed from this match. I needed Elias <laughs> to reach into his <laughs> magic guitar case of holding and pull out like an electric guitar and he strums a note and lightning shoots out of it and it hits Corbin. <laughs> they, they probably still have that Man Mountain Rock guitar, right? Probably. Yeah, I mean, why, why not? Why, why, why couldn't this have been a cinematic match? <laughs> I, I, would have, saying, I would have like, loved to see I would have loved to see lightning strike Corbin off a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just Elias rocking out. Yeah, there you go. Elias is just rocking out to I'm the man on the silver mountain. I'm a man <laughs> on the silver mountain. And him and Corbin are having like an epic duel. You know, Cor Corbin is like commanding the thunder, and he's throwing it at Elias. Elias is deflecting it with his his electric guitar, and he's playing back. You know, 
It would have been amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, but you know what should have happened here? There should have been some sort of stipulation. This this match just existed. Yeah. Like, why not have a stipulation if Elias lost, he has to become Corbin's minstrel? I don't know. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. At least to be a stakes there, yeah. It was it was just uh, these two guys don't like each other, and it, and it's March, so they get a WrestleMania <laughs> match. All right, this stunk. So, yeah. All right. So the next one, one of the big. Oh wait, wait, wait. One, one, one comment here. Sure. So one, one thing that barely anybody mentions is that we actually got to hear Elias's music. Yes. <clears throat> he won, and his music played. I don't That's recall. Right. Now I remember. It. Yeah, I didn't know he had music. <laughs> he does, apparently. And it played after he won. <clears throat> All right, I thought uh, Cameron Grimes was going to do the run-in when I heard it. <laughs> Cameron I Grimes of the true knot. <laughs> um, that's, a, uh, that's a Doctor Sleep reference, everyone. All right. So <laughs> one of our feature bouts of the weekend was Becky Lynch versus Shayna Baszler. Um... You know, it was said by others that this was tailor-made for Shayna Baszler to win so that they could set up a rematch down the line. And I said, don't... The phrase Rocky Three, the movie Rocky Three was uh, thrown out there with Shayna Baszler being Clubber Lang. And I know Christine yes, doesn't watch movies, but... Was that Mr. T? Yes. So oh, I know that one. I didn't see it, but I know it. So Rocky doesn't take T seriously, and he's screwing around through the training. And he's real cocky, and just before the fight, uh, Mickey has a heart attack and nearly dies. He dies after the fight, but um, before that, he had just been shoved, and you know he was having a difficult time. And so Rocky is not only not only taking not taking Clubber Lang seriously, but <clears throat> he's also distracted with the impending doom of his manager. And so, of course, Clubber Lang knocks his head off. And this, of course, sets up the rematch in the third act of the fight where Rocky has to go back to basics. He gets trained by Apollo Creed. He goes out to Los Angeles. He gets some, he, you know, he sheds some pounds. He gets faster. He becomes a whole new fighter. <clears throat> and that was the pitch for Becky and Shayna, where Shayna would just wreck the overconfident, crown-wearing, shitty Becky Lynch. And then they would maybe do a rematch at like SummerSlam or Survivor Series or something. And I said, I have a different boxing movie. Given how the WWE tends to book their matches, I think it's going to be the Great White Hype. Where they build up, build up, build up Shayna Baszler. They make her look like a killer. Which, by the way, I don't know if you saw some of the build up to this, but there was a point at which uh, she, like, Becky Lynch got her revenge on Shayna two or three different times. So going into this was like the epitome of like 50-50 booking. Yeah. Oh, big time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Too much. Every week they flip-flopped, yeah. Right. So nobody had a clear advantage going into this. And they did uh, eight minutes and 30 seconds. And then it just ended. Really lackluster. And Becky must pose. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Really lackluster. So this paid homage to one of my favorite matches, the the good old Bret Hart versus uh, Roddy Piper, WrestleMania 8 brothers. Come on, they did the whole flip over into the uh, into the roll up into the bridge. Really, yeah, but really, I love that. that effective that was, was Bret Hart doing it off the turnbuckle. Yeah, Not true. just doing Absolutely. a little flip uh, yeah, on the mat. Yeah, and you're, right. think, you're right. And I think that's my problem with it was, like, first of all, Bailey, have I ever put you in a sleeper? And you like rolled where my to where my shoulders are pinned. I'm not a fucking idiot. I'm gonna let go. <laughs> yes, please. I'm not trapped. <laughs> you know? This 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 entire match was. Um, so you're right. So one of the things that you said. I mean, you're, they're trying to. It is a great white hype. So it was too much fifty fifty booking going into this one. It should have been. It should have been earthquake versus Hogan, where you're. You know, you you build up the monster heel, uh, and then you feed it to the champion at the end. You know what I mean? And you have the triumphant victory. You know, against all odds, coming at it, coming out of nowhere. But instead, you had so much fifty fifty booking that by the time you got here and Becky actually beat her. With this roll, with this flip over roll up move, um, 
nobody cared. It was sort of like, oh, she beat her. That's terrible. You know what I mean? It really took the emphasis out of it. Going into WrestleMania 2, Bundy, like, caved in Hogan's chest. Loved it. That that right there was the match that actually got me into wrestling. (laughs) Believe it or not. Saturday night's main event, Hogan Morocco. (laughs) Yep. Sure. Um, I've I've referenced... (coughs) I've referenced Hogan Bundy before because, like... I know, you know, the match itself is not a lot of flippity doos, not particularly dynamic, but, you know, going into it, like, you really thought Hogan was in danger. You know, you yeah. thought, you, you know, he had his ribs were taped up, he had the whole Heenan family, <clears throat> Bundy was an imposing figure, who'd already been, who already gotten over on Hogan. You thought, you know, you could be led to believe that King Kong Bundy was. A, you know, had he a was going to win. Hogan. He, yeah. A credible threat. Yeah, he he had the avalanche, which was killing people all the way up through. They built him as this unbeatable heel. You know, they they did the squash against Hogan, injured the ribs, did the whole injury angle. You know, and before this, Hogan hadn't been beat. You know, he he wasn't invincible, shall we say? He didn't He'd never been hand- manhandled like that before. Yes, this is the first time that he was actually manhandled. Right, so. Never manhandle. <laughs> I, I, I love that term. I'm going to use that at work. I'm going to manhandle him. <laughs> I like it. What a maneuver. Um, all right, Sheen, what'd you think of uh, good old Becky versus Shayna Baszler? Uh, I'm going to be echoing a lot of what you guys said here. It was uh, the booking leading up to it was garbage. Uh, they, you know, they had Shayna, who I think is. She is like an X factor. She is something special. She, you know, we're we're away from the you know from the lingerie models as wrestlers here, but she still stands out from the current crop of credible wrestlers. She stands on a different plane because she is so unique, and uh, she does have this aura of just like, uh oh, you know, she could really mess you up. And they and they had to have Becky just take her out. And uh, I I don't know what what is left for Becky to do. Other than they could have gone the way like the Rocky Three way, where she, where Becky was overconfident and she was up on her hubris, and and it almost felt like they were doing that because Becky was very dismissive. But then again, she is a very bad promo and always delivers lines dismissively. But they, <laughs> but they, they had. What do they do with Becky now that she beat Shayna? If the, if at least they had Shayna win. You can you can do the whole redemption chase and you know big victory later on down the line, but now it's like, what are we going to get here? Are we going to get like three more months of Becky beating Shayna, or are they going to beat Shayna for the next two months and then have have her win in three months when nobody cares anymore? Yeah, it just seems to be the old routine over and over again, and then they'll give her the belt in July. No one will care. Vince will be like, see, she did over, and they'll put it back on Becky or Charlotte. And it's uh, it's did, just a did shame. You see how, did you see how they followed this up on Raw? Yep. Did agony, you see the Shane of Shane is... the agony of defeat? The agony of defeat. Yeah. <laughs> I I I was like I was baffled. I was uh, garbage. Well, so so I, I I have to pick some positive out of this because I promised that I would be positive on these podcasts. So one thing that I will say that is that that is a, I know I know it's funny uh, is that here's a positive guys. So you know when uh, Becky drives her semi truck. Oh, and all so the jump dri- cuts. She she, uh, she drives her semi truck to the arena to the venue. Okay. Uh, this is one of the first times that she actually opens the truck door and you don't get to see the stunt driver trying to dive out of the way. <laughs> so, so uh, well played. But, but there were a lot of jump cuts leading up to that moment. If you watch it back. <laughs> Boy, was there ever. <laughs> Edited in a blender. <laughs> get out of the way. Get out of the way. Rumor don't has it. <laughs> Rumor has it that... And this may have been a win by Shayna Baszler had they done this um, in Raymond James Stadium. But rumor has it that a lot of the faces won because they wanted to put smiles on faces. Which is a... <coughs> this put is a another scowl great on mine. Reading, misreading by the WWE bookers <laughs> who assumed the people watching at home 
many of which are people like us that would want to see Becky win this. It's like, nope. <laughs> and this and this really took the air out of the room for me. And, 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 WWE putting scowls on people's faces <laughs> since 1963. But uh, it's it seems like, you know, the, we were talking before you came on, uh, Bailey, where uh, WWE played this as though nothing was different. This was just a regular business-as-usual show and uh, didn't make any adjustments. They, they actually touted it more as the, you know, too big for one night bullshit. And then oh. they're going to do the thing where... where they put smiles on faces by having the baby faces win. It's which which side is it? Are we are we pandering or are we not? Are we are we trying to adjust or are we not? And uh, it, you can't do both. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this was such a mess. Yeah, I was not thrilled with this. No. no. Actually, right. th- I think this is when I actually left to go on a run. <laughs> I, I turned it off and I went for a run because I was like, okay, I'm done for now. Is the next match the ladder match? I believe so. It's I had to, uh... Sammy Zayn. No, it's Sammy Zayn. Oh, okay, no, Brown. then I did stay one more match before I went for a run. Okay. Okay, so yes, the next one is Sammy Zayn, uh, who defeated Daniel Bryan in 9 minutes and 20 seconds for the IC strap. Um, <clears throat> I had said in the preview I did with Larry that I thought this was going to be like Ricky Steamboat Macho Man. Like, this was going to be the worst. <laughs> <laughs> what the <laughs> Blew fuck are you that call. <laughs> that this was going to be like the worker's main event, you know. I thought these two were going to just go indie, riffic, ring of honor, who gives a fuck. We may never wrestle again. Let's, you know, let's, let's go to the moon. And instead, Sami Zayn did his best Memphis impression. <laughs> Which was fun. <laughs> they had a short match, and Sami Zayn ended up winning. Uh, this was not what I wanted from these two, but uh, like I said about Cesaro, cashing checks and breaking necks. This Sami put this in put this in perspective. So Sami Zayn defeats Daniel Bryan, who only several years ago main evented WrestleMania, won the championship, and now he's losing. In 10 minutes, the Sami Zayn in an IC title match. Put, put that in perspective, how far the mighty have fallen here. Well, I think he's taking time off again to go have another kid. So yeah. it's like, at this point... So he, he's, he's he's basically he's doing, doing the Ricky favorites. Steamboat. He's doing the Steamboat for him. He's yeah, like, you're see? getting time off for your family? Well, <laughs> we'll just drop it, make you lose the belt to the honky-tonk man. Yeah, pretty much. What'd you think, uh, Sheen? Yep. Uh, this felt this felt like a SmackDown match, um, down to the running, the, down to the you know the the high jinks and cahoots on the outside. It was uh, when they when they both rolled outside, I expected someone to say Raw rolls on after this. It was just <laughs> not special. Um, it, and I mean that's it just wasn't great. <laughs> just, I, I'm trying to like think of like ways to uh, describe it, but there really is no no way to accurately describe. Or no way to eloquently describe it. It's just a, a match that happened, and uh, what are you going to do? It just uh, it was another case of they don't like each other. It's March. Hey, WrestleMania is coming up. And you uh, know what? Daniel Bryan's contract is up at the end of the year, so this is uh, this could be the beginning script of the writing on the wall right here. Uh, is he is he still doing the dosi do of I'm not going to sign again? Oh, you know that's always in play, but it it seems a little bit more prevalent here. All right, so the next match was the ladder match for the <laughs> the singles ladder match for the tag team titles. Because <laughs> apparently mm. Miz showed up sick and was like, get out of here, heathen. People were like <laughs> throwing holy water on him. Throwing holy like, water, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> John Morrison parkoured his way to a win. Okay, so... <laughs> So they're all fighting over the belts. He, he parkoured his way to a win. Um, so <laughs> Kofi Kingston and Uso number one are pulling on the hook that holds the titles up, and John Morrison pulls the titles off and falls onto his back. And the, Kofi Kingston, but he drops, but but he falls on his back and he drops the belts. They don't come <laughs> down with them. Then he has to collect them to say he wins. <laughs> I love it. So, so there, there are two belts in this match, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. 
they had the opportunity to do something interesting here, and they did not. Just like the, any time they have a tag team ladder title match, why not have Kofi and one of the Usos each get a belt? Yeah, somebody then else what made do you that, do? you know, the wacky tag team partner type thing. It, I mean, we, we've been we've been complaining about the New Day being stale. We've been complaining about the Usos being stale. This this could actually lead to stories, but no, <laughs> they didn't do any of that. It's just a uh, a placeholder match, which was just so. Uh, it's it another one, just uh, another match that was just there. This went well, almost. This, this was. Yep. Go ahead. I was gonna say this went almost twenty minutes, and look, it's hard to fuck up a ladder match. But a ladder match really does need a crowd. Uh, to doing like there are certain matches here, I can kind of forgive the no audience thing because I'm I'm enraptured in what's going on, and I was enraptured in what was going on here because these are motherfuckers falling off ladders. So like mm-hmm. you know, I like a good stunt show. But hearing so, I can't remember which NXT UK show it was, but. Um, I think it was like Flash Morgan or whatever, where he was doing something off a ladder and the, ch- the crowd was chanting, please don't die. And like, that's what this yep. is missing. You know, so here, it's just three guys having like a bunkhouse brawl, <laughs> just throwing ladders <laughs> at each other, falling off shit. And it's like, okay, this is great and all. You know, certainly I commend these guys for doing their jobs and doing it well and making it visually entertaining, but it is lacking that one element. Yeah, it was like a like an empty. So, so we always ask the question: If a tree falls in the woods and no one's around, does it make a sound? Well, this proved that it absolutely doesn't because this was <laughs> uh, this was the match that suffered the entire two over the course of the two nights. This match suffered the most with uh, with zero crowd pop. And uh, I don't know about you, but John Morrison does nothing for me, man. He uh, he's a like it seems when he's with the Miz and they do vignettes and all that stuff, that rap thing they did, man, the other day was hilarious. Oh, I love but, hey, uh, that, that rap song is fantastic. Oh, that is one of the best things that I've seen in a long time. <laughs> that is really solid. But I mean, you got two guys who are basically meaningless here right now with Kingston and Uso here in this match, and having Morrison, uh, it it just felt empty. It felt like it, it it served no purpose. And I mean, they 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 literally screwed up the ending. He fell off and he dropped the belts. It could, it could have been anybody's game. They could have walked down the ladder, picked up the belts, and oh, we're good. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but anyway, sadly, I love Sheehan's uh, idea to have two to have to split the belts. That would have been genius. But uh, sadly, there was nothing genius, and it was about twenty minutes of my life. I'm never going to get back on this one. I said earlier, mm-hmm. I wish they had filmed this on a construction site. Oh, yeah, right. that would have been awesome with Coco Beware singing Pile Driver. Oh my God, yeah. See, and and that's another thing. Like these matches need like like music in the background. They all needed soundtracks. We needed New Jack to run in on every single match. <laughs> we have Natural Born Killers playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Uso getting stapled. Yeah, New Jack vacuums and then hits somebody over the head with the vacuum. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what this was. That this this would have very much benefited from the new Jack treatment. Yes, for sure. Okay, um, so if they were going to cut something, I would have definitely said cut this. Once Roman Reigns was like, "Nope, I got the leukemia, deuces," which you know, <laughs> I don't doubt. I don't. I believe me. I uh, I don't particularly love Roman Reigns, but. I 100% supported him here. I was like, no, if they're talking about, sure. like, people like me and him and people, you know, it's like, you may or may not have had the COVID since November, since, like, December. Uh, some people are theorizing. <laughs> but most people get over it without, like, the benefit of any kind of real medication. But if you have some other comor- comorbidity, yeah. you know, like cancer you know, heart disease or whatever. Those are the people that are dying from this thing. This thing, it's in and of itself. You know, it's kind of like how HIV attacks your immune system, and it's not the HIV that kills you; it's everything else. You know? Yes, exactly. So, well, you know, I'm, I'm surprised Vince didn't just go, "Here's some hydroxychloroquine. Get in the <laughs> ring." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we'll, we'll wrestle in a hazmat suit. <laughs> New gimmick, <laughs> goddammit. 
<laughs> Can't you just wear a mask? It'll be like the new shield gear, right? It's hazmat suits. Here you go. Here's a cloth mask, faggot. Now get in the ring and get speared by Goldberg. <laughs> it's good shit, pal. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was less than three minutes. They spammed finishers. <laughs> And Braun Strowman got a pity title win. And speaking of this, speaking of things that did no favors for anybody, God, Braun Strowman. <laughs> Braun Strowman, who was like the hottest heel at one point, was flipping over fucking ambulances, was doing matches with Roman Reigns, Samoa Joe, and Brock Lesnar. Now just got out of a feud with Sammy fucking Zayn and gets a pity title that win. That he lost. Yeah, that he lost. <laughs> And then gets a pity title win because Roman Reigns got the leukemia. Like, <laughs> God, if you're bro- by the way, I did you? I'm going to throw throw this in there because there's not really a whole lot to talk about with the wrestling here. Uh, Sheen, did you ha- did you hear the whole like Twitter kerfluffle with Braun Strowman? You know, I I saw in my recommended videos uh, Jim Cornette's uh, reply to him, but I didn't watch it. So I'm guessing something happened on on, on the socials. One of the indie guys basically said, hey, you know, in this time where a lot of us are not able to, you know, this is the gig economy. A lot of us, this is all we do. And right now we're not able to work. So if you can go to like Pro Wrestling Tees or go to a wrestler's website and like buy a shirt or send a donation if, oh, it was it was Evil Uno who said it from the Dark Order, um, so he was like, "Look, we're all doing okay because we're all like on guaranteed contracts with AEW. Plus, they're still filming, but a lot of guys are not able to make money right now because of the shelter in place situation, and they don't do anything else. So, kind of, and I and I made this point to Larry, like, you know, Crowbar, who's a heavy metal band, their tour got canceled, and they were like, "Hey, our tour got canceled, obviously." Um, we're not making any money right now, and we're sitting on all of our tour shirts that obviously we can't sell. So, you know, if you can, if you have an extra dollar to spare, please buy a shirt, which I did because I like Crowbar. Um, and there's a lot of people that, that are, you know, that are doing that. They're like, hey, you know, <laughs> not a whole lot we can do right here. They're trying to figure out ways to do stuff through like Skype and shit or YouTube or whatever. Um, sure. And so Braun Strowman's reaction to that. What, you know, who's, so Evil Uno is basically saying, if you have a dollar to spare, spend it on your favorite wrestler, if you please. And Braun Strowman said, fuck your couch. <laughs> Stop begging for money, you homeless person. I showed up. <laughs> I showed. I quit Strongman because it didn't make, pay enough money, and I showed up to the performance center with $150 in my pocket, and now I'm, you know, and now I'm rich on my hard work stop being a you know, s- pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and take care of yourself you know you you begging people and the entire he's, like twitterverse he's very him inspiring and went, what the fuck is wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely one of those like even if look there's a lot of shit that i like roll my eyes about like you know a lot of people that are like doing you know a lot of celebrities who are trying to participate in the culture through Skype. We're all in this together. Yeah. And it, and it's not my place to be like, this all looks like shit. I don't, can't you people just read a book? But I know um, (laughs) it's, they're trying other people like it. Fine. It, it, I don't have to react to this. And Braun Strowman's one of these people who shouldn't, who who just should have had his Twitter taken away. Cause clearly he doesn't (laughs) know when to log off. (laughs) <laughs> I'm surprised that they didn't shut that down very, very quickly. Did did they, anyone intervene on that? I mean, eventually I think Braun Strowman just stopped reacting. And then, of course, yeah, Jim Cornette got asked about it, and Jim Cornette was like, you showed up to the performance out of the $150, you're a grown adult. Why are you talking about other people's bad decisions? So, <laughs> clearly you didn't make a lot of them, a lot of great decisions. If you only had $150 and you're a grown adult man, which I thought was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that like a hundred and forty dollars more than the Rock had when he showed up in Memphis? Yeah, right. One hundred and forty-three dollars more. <laughs> oh, the eggs at seven bucks, right? <laughs> All right, so there it is. There's my my take on Braun Strowman Goldberg. Sheehan, you have the conch. 
Um, well, I, I don't know who the security guards were guarding Goldberg from on the way to the ring. I thought that was <laughs> something. Dude, my son picked um, that up. He was like, why is he being guarded if it's empty? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I got to figure that this was like, maybe they went to Goldberg and it's like, hey, Roman's not going to not gonna come. And he's like, he's like, I only... And I want it over with, so we got to do this match somehow. <laughs> uh, I I don't know that Strowman was the guy. Um, I, I guess I guess he was as good as guy as any. I I thought they should bring back Lightning Foot Jerry Flynn from uh from from back in WCW because <laughs> he used to fight in the block all the time, which was a closed off set on Nitro, and uh, could have fit in perfectly with these days. And he he was like like eight or nine of Goldberg's defeats on the, on his undefeated streak. So nice. He's got history with Goldberg. Um, and I think this, <laughs> this could have been his year, but it was, a uh, it was a shitty match. It was a, it was a standard Goldberg match where it was finisher spam. And, uh, and that was it. <laughs> you know, one of the finishers hit and he didn't kick out of it. This, this was just a retread of, uh, of Lesnar Goldberg from mania 33 be quite that, honest with you, actually, it had that actually felt it, a lot more like a lot more stuff seemed to happen in that match. Yeah, I think Brock well, it Lesnar started actually the, did like it, a leapfrog. Yeah, it, well, it started it started the exact same way where they did the three spear thing, and then they had to come back, and then it was over. You know what I mean? Mm, so same sure. same basic formula. This was this was Vince McMahon's statement saying that okay, Roman, you're staying home. You know, uh, you you got you got the weakness called the leukemia. So uh, your time is uh, your time is done, and uh, bring on next. And next was uh, he looked he looked left in the locker room, and Braun Strowman was sitting there, and he's like, "Braun, you're getting the belt," and that was the end of it. Yeah, here's, here's your pretty belt. You think yeah, Roman will come back to like a ballerina gimmick in a couple months or something? <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> well, think about this. He's a he's a dual champion now. He's still got that Saudi Arabia title too. <laughs> <laughs> Like the greatest great. royal, the greatest royal rumble title. You know what the best thing about this entire match was? Mm. The best thing about this entire match is that we completely skipped Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know what? Um, I had to thank you, Mark. <laughs> I had to switch from my computer to the couch briefly, and I so I was looking on my phone, and yeah. All right, Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins. Which was a little less than twenty minutes, and they had a match. They did a big spot. Um, there was a DQ. They were like, "No, no, no, not like this, not that way." James, I'm not clean down there. Um, <laughs> Shout out to you, Pete. What? what is that a reference to? That is a reference I to my enough. friend Pete doing an impression. Of many number of James Bond women going, no, James, <laughs> not that way. I'm not clean down there. And they were like, <laughs> like that's the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to remember that one. Oh. That is the worst thing. <laughs> uh, shout out to you, Pete. Oh, anyway. Man. So, yes, not that way. And they restart the match and... Finally, after feuding for 150 years, Kevin Owens finally gets over on the Monday Night Messiah, Seth Rollins. It was fine. Um, this went unneedlessly long. <clears throat> this probably could have gotten away with being about five minutes shorter, all told. Yes, you... or, or, or a couple edits shorter. So yeah. they had that giant stunt spot where, where Owens jumps off the sign through the, uh, through, the, through the announce table and all that stuff, which looked amazing. So it actually got me back into the match temporarily for two seconds. And then they showed the replay. And then you saw the airbags. Then you saw dual <laughs> airbags. And, and the edits got... This is an edited show, guys. Like, this has been edited and was in the can for days. And nobody picked up on this? That you could see the giant side of an airbag pop out when Owens came off that table? It came <laughs> off the top? I, I just... I don't know. It's like, the, uh, it's like the Becky Lynch truck stunt driver guy. Like, you should not have that in the picture. <laughs> um, they really should have just made this a new DQ match from the start. Yeah. Yes. And let him like tear up the set. Let him like throw the barricades everywhere. You know, have Kevin Owens beat Seth Rollins with Michael Cole. It'd have been fine. Sure. All right. Anything else about this one, Sheehan? 
Uh, this is where my feed started to go a little wonky. Um, I don't know if this is something that just affected me, but uh, <laughs> uh, these these two nights worth of shows here, the uh, the feed was horrendously choppy uh, in, in my, on my end, anyway. And uh, I, I turned away for a second, and I turned back, and I see both Rollins and Owens writhing on the ground. And uh, then the announcer, who, who the hell was the announcer, Byron or whoever, was saying, like, Kevin Owens is climbing up the sign, and I'm still watching them writhing around on the ground. And it's like, oh, he's on top of the sign. I'm like, no, he's not. He's lying on the ground. And then, like, all of a sudden, it, like, zipped to them on the ground again, but Owens was, like, crushing uh, Rollins. So I was like, ah, oh, I missed the damn spot. But uh, I thought this thing... Just like any time Owens and Rollins are in a ring together or in a room together or in a building together, time stands still. It took <laughs> took too damn long. I don't know what – like this this feud has like such weird contrived heat because I just don't – I don't see why, why this feud is even here at this point. It's uh, very, very dull and uh, the match was way too long. Yeah, they and, to and Tom – Tom Phillips was right there to say Kevin Owens has burned it down at WrestleMania. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and now we come to it. The Boneyard match. <coughs> because we couldn't say cemetery or graveyard. No. <coughs> Between the Undertaker... Oh, can, we, can, we, can we get Mark some hydroxychloroquine, please? Oh. <laughs> I'll take Fredman's own. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. The Undertaker in his American Badass gimmick versus the comedy stylings of AJ Styles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, I know AJ has struggled with having a personality, but him coming out of the casket in the beginning was hilarious. That was great. So, so good. Th- this is everything I wanted WrestleMania to be. Um, 100%. You know, as I said earlier, we know... It's not, you know, it's sports entertainment. We know that these are predetermined finishes. The moves don't always hurt like they say it does. You know, we know, for lack of a better word, it's fake. So We know that the steel steps aren't 700 pounds. (laughs) So, if you don't have a crowd, and you have an opportunity to really lean into, like making it cinematic this is what I wanted it to be my only problem with this was I wish the music had been a bit more zippy at times like there are parts of this where it's like a little piano concerto and it's like oh this is very sad like like I want (laughs) you know like there are parts that are just really slow and then of course the whole way (coughs) And here's the thing. The Undertaker is obviously a fairly bright guy. He's, you know, he's done very, very well for himself in the world of wrestling. But as an extemporaneous speaker, without, like, bullet points or a direction, where he just basically has to, like, trash talk for 20 minutes, wow, he's terrible. Like, (laughs) after about 10 minutes of him, gone, AJ, what's my wife's name? I'm like, all right, I got it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's not like AJ was much better because again after you kind of got over the initial teasing of the Undertaker it's like ugh and then this is another one where it's a lot of grunting and groaning and you know if you watch a movie during a fight scene there's always very bombastic music you know it isn't like you don't see like a bar fight and then it's like a little piano solo there's usually like ACDC or some shit playing in the background that's what this really needed. Like, going back to the New Jack thing. Like, this should have been accompanied by... You know, they should have had Metallica playing the whole time. Um, but other than that, like... <laughs> I cracked up hard when he was surrounded by druids and they attacked him one at a time. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> and then he... And then he's, you know, he's in the he's in the casket. He's in the grave. <coughs> And the uh, and AJ Styles is like gleefully trying to dump the dirt on him, and he appears behind him. I really wanted him to say, I "Want to see something really scary, AJ?" <laughs> 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 I 
All right, I'm gonna take a breath here. Go ahead, uh, Bailey. This was uh, this was my ten out of ten at the at the Tokyo Dome here, man. This was <laughs> this was the epitome of sports entertainment right here. And you know what? Something that the Undertaker desperately needed. So I mean, you think about what the Undertaker has gone through in his last several fights. I mean, just missing moves all over the place, just being slightly off. He was completely on on this one. And, of course, it's because of editing and clever music and everything. But he came back. He had, like, he had the, his big evil look, you know what I mean? His hardcore look but from back in the Attitude Era when he's fighting, like, Jeff Hardy and the boys. And it really, really struck out to me. I mean, he came in on the motorcycle. He was a complete badass the entire time. He busted his arm on some glass early on, and he, he was, was bleeding like a stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I agree. I mean, he was talking He was talking his way through it, but they're creating noise, you know what I mean? I mean, I know that he's saying, come on, boy, and calling him Alan and all these different things, you know what I mean? But, uh, man, uh, there there was one scene in particular that sticks out to me, and he's about to bury AJ, and he and he gets aboard the, uh, the tractor or the plow or whatever he's getting on there, and the light shines in behind, and it just looks so hilarious. He's he's like an estral figure uh, on this on this uh, <laughs> plow about to bury him. It was it was wicked, but um, I man, I just I dug every part of this. Um, it's something that. I think that Cena wide a little bit later on was missing. It was the flow and the the complete story. This seemed like one solid match, you know what I mean? Like it was one consistent story, whereas the other one felt like a little bit of piecemeal. So I loved it, man. I can't, I can't speak highly enough about it, and it was definitely the highlight of night one, and I think it had the internet buzzing, man. I think they hit a home run here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I think uh, my only complaint is that uh, when when the Undertaker came in on the motorcycle, it wasn't American Badass playing. I, I thought that <laughs> oh. would have been a neat little callback. Uh, as much as I really don't care for that song, it would have been a neat callback. Um, this, uh, you know, going to the New Jack thing, this felt very much like uh, like the old ECW hardcore TV sort of stuff, where it is matches that are clipped and edited to hide deficiencies and make everybody look as good as possible. And I think they did a fantastic job of that. Um, the music, the slow music, uh, it felt very kind of Red Dead Redemption to me, um, where you would have, you know, some gory scenes with very somber music uh, as kind of the uh, juxtaposing audio for it. But the one part that made me actually crack up is when uh, Gallows and Anderson showed up and, like, they played, like, a weird harmonica riff. <laughs> like... Like like they were <laughs> like they were like two bandits showing up at a saloon or something. <laughs> like the the record scratch that was awesome. Like, oh, I thought that was hilarious. Um really just such a such a great uh fun match. Uh I love that they leaned into the camp so much. Uh and it only emphasizes the fact that they didn't do that for the rest of the show. They, they this yeah. is they should have had more fun play with the limitations as best you can be creative and try to hide the fact that we're in the middle of what we're in the middle of right now and uh this this match was was wonderful i'm glad it was the main event of a show um now aj styles can say he main evented wrestlemania so there's that uh i'm glad that this wasn't shoved in the middle of the show it was a really the perfect way to end the first night all right so night two um i joked on twitter i was like WWE, we want a Riot Squad triple threat. Well, here's Liv Morgan and Natalia. Great. <laughs> <clears throat> my son thinks Liv Morgan's like bondage outfit was fantastic, and he wants more of it. My little uh, oh, me too, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> he is all boy, my little six year old. Um, <laughs> and that's about as much as I want to remember about this match. I don't have anything else to add. Can you can, like I I was to the point where I thought that not only did Liv Morgan beat Natalia here, but I thought she actually had a chance of uh, of winning last night on Raw as well. So you know, it it put the fear of God in me that they were going to push Liv Morgan to the moon. This, My wife when did pointed, this match happen? It was on the pre-show. My wife pointed oh, okay, out okay. that like Liv Morgan and Mandy Rose look a lot alike, and I'm like, yeah, they have a lot of like similar facial features. And that's the thing, like, Liv Morgan used to look all punk rock, and she did the green tongue and everything. She, like, she made herself look different. Now she's just another blonde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just another blonde. (laughs) Speaking of blondes, as she's called, Lady Big Dog, Charlotte Flair, defeated Rhea Ripley by submission in roughly 
uh, 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Now, I said on the preview of this, I said, well, I'm of two minds. There's, you know, and again, I'm going to make another Star Trek reference here. This is the mirror mirror match for me. In the good universe, Rhea Ripley wins and she gets put over big time by Charlotte Flair. She's a made woman. She can go back to NXT and just run that division. <clears throat> However, in the evil universe, where you have to stab the guy above you in order to get ahead, and Spock has an evil mustache, <laughs> Charlotte Flair wins, goes to NXT, and does the women's version of the Reign of Terror. And that's what we got. This was a, an okay match. I thought, you know, the, I think the two women did a really good job with it. <clears throat> it. It loses something because of the ending for me. I really wanted Ripley to, to, to win, and I felt like she should have. But I, And I don't really understand why you would do this to her in the, after putting her over so huge last fall. There was outside interference. There was outside interference uh, called the uh, travel visa or the work visa. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, we'll see, you know, what happens with Charlotte Flair. I mean, if this is like, <clears throat> if this is the beginning of something that's going to get better over time once the world resumes normalcy, okay. But in that moment, like one match in, and you've already taken the air out of the show for me. Like I had a hard time getting back on board with this. So, um, Chin, I agree. I I think that. Uh... I think that had because that that's like the big rumor right now is that uh, that Rhea has some travel or has some work visa issues and that's why they did this the way they did. Um, but uh, if not for that, or yeah, I, it it seems like a really tone deaf decision, which seems to be anytime Charlotte wins uh, is is kind of our reaction. Like, wow, they're very tone deaf about this, and uh, I don't know exactly when. We became so uh, adversarial with the WWE. Uh, it feels like ever since like we we told them we didn't want Cena as the top guy, <laughs> they they became very very incensed on telling us who the guy or the girl is. And uh, yeah, I, I I'm not a fan of uh, of Charlotte. I'm not a fan of whatever she's going to be doing now. I guess the the prevailing theory, theory is that she's going to be defending the NXT belt on all three brands so we get to see her three nights a week now um yay uh, <clears throat> yeah it just feels like uh i i guess if you wanted to open the show disappointing you, you, they 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 did their job um but it, it's just another one of those matches that i would have i would have had like an injury angle written into and just cancel it you know push it out have have someone attack someone in the back and have someone sub for someone else do something to where you can make this match what it's supposed to be at a later date when, when we're all back to normal. Bailey? Well, as someone who studied a bunch of Ric Flair matches, this one uh, was hardly original. This is this is actually Ric Flair versus Sting uh, in a series of the rematches, and I kid you not, it's almost move for move, uh, right down to the fact that we had uh, a series of missed moves, the high spot off the top rope, right into the small package for a near fall, into the figure four for the tap out. I mean, this is someone, she studied her own father's match, and that's exactly what we got. I mean, take a look at even the ring gear that Rhea Ripley wore to the ring i mean it's 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 sting-esque if you ask me and this is this is the this is the i mean a clean victory i mean you had charlotte flair win i don't really know what the uh what the idea behind it is i, I think there's more money in the chase i think it had more to do with the visa issue than anything because i honestly think if that didn't pop up i think uh i think we'd be seeing uh a rhea ripley extended uh extended title reign but i think for right now we're stuck with charlotte on nxt which uh, which needs a bit of a shot of adrenaline, so I'm not against it. But uh, this match was a little bit of a letdown. I, I I dug it for the most part, but it was uh, there was just something a little little bit of a pace off. Now that being said, Charlotte seemed well on her game. Rhea, on the other hand, was uh, was a slop fest. I mean, the riptide she tried to pull off was a disaster, and just a couple of the moves trying to piece things together, they didn't have good chemistry. So overall, I mean, half decent match here, but. Um, you know, I I don't really know what to think of the uh, of uh, Charlotte winning. I I I just don't know. I mean, you you have people who are poised uh, 
to go to the next level, like Shayna and of course Rhea, and you don't pull the trigger on them here at Mania. Yeah, this this almost screams of like James Storm in TNA. You know, oh, you're a oh, whole good analogy, excellent. You're all ready to go, and eh, maybe not now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alistair Black did any did it. But did anyone bring up, I don't know how you guys started the show because I missed it, did anyone bring up Stephanie McMahon and her face yes. melting like a candle to introduce the show? <laughs> yep. It really stuck out here when she introduced Night 2. Like, she was literally melting before our eyes. I don't know. All right. Anyway, on to Alistair Black. Yes, Alistair Black had a pointless match with Bobby Lashley. Um, the highlight of this one was Lana not being satisfied with Bobby Lashley winning dominantly. So she says, do this, not that. Which, of course, gives Aleister Black the moment to take control. He hits Bobby Lashley with the Black Mass. One, two, three. Less than eight minutes, Aleister Black wins. Whoop-de-doo. Bailey? And and then he shows up the next night on Ron has a three and a half hour match against... uh... (laughs) Who did he fight last Apollo night? Apollo Cruz. Apollo Cruz forever. God, I, Wrestle, I celebrated Wrestle five forever. birthdays. I yeah. turned. It, I, I think I turned it off after the first, the first twenty minutes of the show. I'm like, I'm so bored with this. I'm like, I can't even watch it anymore. So, did, did you see? You yeah. didn't see the uh, the main event then, did you? No, sir. Of Raw. No. Ooh, then because that they they actually showed what happened after the main event of this night. So uh, we, we can share that with you when we get there. Oh boy! Oh, oh boy! You don't. Hulk want Hogan enough. came out. Salt was thrown in the eyes. It was a pretty good deal. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was. It, yep, it was. It was Fuji and uh, and Yoko all over again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but anyway, I don't, I don't see I don't see the passion behind Alistair Black, and I think it's starting to become evident that this guy is not the second coming of CM Punk. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, the water is being let out of Bobby Lashley, and it seems like the, his thing with Lana is just about over because this seemed to be going in a direction to break up this team. So I really don't know what the future holds for Lana, but it doesn't look very good. As for Lashley, um, I'm thinking we're going to see Lashley paired up with someone a little bit different moving forward. And I wasn't against Leo Rush originally. I loved that guy when he was going around, Lashley, La-. I love that stuff. But, but anyway, I think this is a turning of the tide for some of these characters, but... I'm not really sure that I'd put a paycheck behind Aleister Black on uh, being a main eventer quite yet. He's he's not there, man. He's CM Punk without all his punkness. Yeah, he's CM I, was gonna say, I was going to say I was going to say he a... doesn't even measure up to Corey Graves. <laughs> who's dollar store CM Punk anyway? Yeah, I'm Aleister Black has a cool look, but he has he has like the personality of drywall. Mhm. It's just, and and I and I think they're trying to make him like you know, ooh, he's spooky or he's very secretive and mysterious, but it just comes off as. I'm sorry, sitting Indian style in the ring is not interesting. Nope. Or he needs an ice cream bar, and he he's not there. <laughs> all right. In our Love Conquers All match, Otis defeated Zol- Dolph Ziggler <coughs> in <coughs> less than nine minutes. Uh, Mandy Rose came out. She wasn't going to allow Sonya Deville to uh, give Dolph Ziggler the advantage, and Dolph Ziggler got punched in the dick. <laughs> Gave mm-hmm. Otis the opportunity to win. Otis did his... How is... I think Jim Cornette asked this question. How the hell is uh, the worm... How does that like worm caterpillar thing that he does not end with a splash? He's a big fatty. What's he... <laughs> Throw your belly on him. What's wrong with you? Sure. <laughs> And then the uh, the hero won the gal. I totally thought that because Vince McMahon hates the fans, that Dolph Ziggler was going to win because you know fat guy shouldn't have love. But no, <laughs> uh, Vince McMahon uh, let the hero win and get the girl, and they had a little smooch, and it was fantastic, you- and everybody loved it. If this had an audience, I guarantee you this would have been the second coming of Randy Liz WrestleMania 7. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not even joking. I think they did such a great job. One of the only matches on this card that they've done a good job of building a feud. Now, you can say it's corny, cheesy, whatever you want to say, but they actually built this match up properly, and I cared for once about a Dolph Ziggler match. Imagine that. And I was super happy when uh, 
good old Otis managed to get the girl. That was just, uh, I almost had a slight quiver of the lip and a tear in my eye. <laughs> were you wearing your uh, yellow slicker and your yellow uh, rain cap in the crowd? <laughs> oh, man. Boo to you, stereotyping us Newfoundlanders. <laughs> Boo. Uh, uh, now this this match here, uh, they 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 did the build up, which was which was good. It was good build up, and uh, they they did that thing with the glitchy uh, the glitchy like almost GTV sort of thing, like from back in the the Attitude Era, where they you know the the whole jig was up with Sonya sending the text to uh, to, to Otis to send him off the track and all this stuff. Do you think that that gimmick that you know they're watching gimmick is going to be something that resumes, or is it just for this one uh, feud? Uh, who knows? Nope, I bet you it's I bet you it's something that's going to carry on. I, so I liked it actually. I th- yeah, just a little. Yep, I think it's definitely going to be something else. Who do you think? Who's pretty... your guess? Don't know. Don't know. I was just about to ask you guys if uh, if oh. this was supposed to be a new character or, or what. My guess um, is the laptop GM. <laughs> <laughs> it's horns, Rocco. Yeah, all right. I think it might be. All right, so Edge defeated Randy Orton in nine hours in a last man standing match. In 59 minutes. <clears throat> this went on forever. And this was brutal, but it was a lot of the same shit over and over. And it was a lot of, like, trying to dramatically sell the 10 count. It's to the point where, like, I was watching this one with my wife and kids, and we were all just screaming, just stay down already! <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh... This needed about ten minutes cut off of it, at a minimum. What was ten the legit? Uh, what was the legit uh, match time for this? Thirty-six. Thirty-six minutes. God. Yeah, oh yeah, because it felt. It, it, I, was, I know we're joking with the length here, but God, it felt like it was endless. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to invite both of you guys to Newfoundland. Sheehan, I'm going to give you the cell phone to record it. I'm going to put Mark in a headlock and walk him down and punch him in the face downtown St. John's, and we're going to record it. <laughs> For thirty six <laughs> minutes, and it's going to be the exact same match. This was this was a disaster. I don't even know how to put it. Like they went on way too long. They did the Chris Benoit hanging spot with the uh, exercise equipment, which was classless. <laughs> yes, they did. They did it. They did. You're right. It was. Uh, I, I mean, they were grunting and groaning. It sounded like a, a male orgy half the time. You're walking by the screen. Uh, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Just I don't know. They 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 went too long. And I mean, this needed to be 15 minutes. It needed to be a brawl. But they lost their intensity. They stayed too long on shots. And I mean, this is an edited pay per view. You could have edited the crap out of this and made this at like a super fast pace hardcore battle with with high stakes, but instead it was just like, man, I hate myself for watching it. Let alone these guys hating each other. <laughs> man, <laughs> I think this was the. I think this actually had to be the biggest disappointment in the entire uh, two nights of WrestleMania. But yeah, by far they Stop really there. swung sure. and missed yeah. on this one. You can finish up, Sheen. Yeah, it uh, instead of this being a you know high impact brawl, it was almost like like two scorned lovers fighting each other. It was just like uh, it was like almost romantic how like they would like do these big attacks and then just like look at each other laying there. And uh, first, I, one thing I want to say, I hate the ref for this match. This ref always annoys me. Every time I look, I don't like looking at his face. Um, <laughs> he, he strikes look me as the kind face. of guy like if you if you asked him for directions, he'd like flex and point, you know. He's like, oh, the beach, it's over there. You know, he strikes me as that kind of guy. I don't know the guy, but his face annoys me, and that's just what I think when I see him. But uh, the counts were were, were shit. Um, He was counting when they were, like, on their knees, but sometimes he was counting when they were not on their knees. Sometimes he wasn't counting when they were laying down. It it was very uneven with the counts. Um, I think it also hurt the fact that, like, two weeks ago on NXT, uh, Ciampa and Gargano did this better in the same same building. Yeah, yep, absolutely. We saw it. It's like, oh, that's the main conference room. It's like, yeah, we saw it on NXT like two weeks ago, and they tore it up. And here, it was just very, very plodding, very, very slow. A lot of uh, dependency on, oh, Edge's neck is hurt. It's like you can only do that once or twice, but every time he hit the ground, it's like, uh oh, Edge's neck. They should Uh-oh, have left Edge's the performance neck. center. Like the, they should have went into the, the uh, parking lot. They should have done something. Yeah, but uh, they could have fought in Disney. It was, uh, no one's there right now. 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, like, they should have done this Roddy Piper, Goldust style, and started the match. Oh, sure. Start, started the night with it. They leave the performance, and it's like, well, we'll come back to this, and we'll see where this goes. And, like, <clears throat> I don't know if they could have pulled this off, but I think it would have been funny. Like, you know, they're fighting on, like, it's a small world. Um, <laughs> oh, so good. So good. <laughs> you and, come back to it. And Randy's fighting. wearing women's underwear. <laughs> you come back to it. They're fighting, you know, down <laughs> Universal City Walk. <laughs> Edge is like chasing Randy Orton down a water slide. Accidentally walk into an impact taping and fight their way through that. <laughs> it would, it would give us something more to talk about, that's for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, this uh, I, I almost felt bad for Edge. This being his, you know, his big WrestleMania moment comeback here. Uh, not great. Not great, and, and and you know this one actually had a pretty decent build up. I, I really dug the stuff that Randy Randy was coming across like a like a complete sociopath uh, leading into this, you know, with his deal with Beth and stuff. I thought that was really well done, and none of that hatred was really here. It was instead of Randy coming in to to like beat him up, he hits him with an RKO. It's like yeah, yeah. that doesn't scream blood feud to me. That screams oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit I, you with my I, finish. I don't know. They did. They did the uh, the hanging Benoit spot, which was uh, which got called out all over Twitter. So I didn't even put two and two together until you mentioned it. Oh yeah, it was there, brother. It was profound. Yeah. All right, moving this along before I completely run out of breath. The Street Profits <laughs> defeated <clears throat> Angel Garza, or as Jim Cornette calls him, the Twat, and Austin Theory. <laughs> Who, <laughs> second to Braun I thought Umberto Strowman. was the twat. <laughs> second to Austin to Braun Strowman, <clears throat> Austin Theory got like a pity place in the, this WrestleMania. Like, all right, who do we have from who do we have from NXT who can actually like wrestle? Oh, this Austin Theory kid. All right, well since nine other people aren't available, get him up here. Um, He's like like Austin Theory is like welfare Finn Balor. He's like going to be the evil Finn Balor when they do the feud. He's going to be like a. He's going to be the alternate demon. I guarantee you one night because he's very similar in body type. He's very you know, similar facially. facially. So I think yep. if I think if we ever see uh, the the second demon, it's definitely going to be Austin Theory, the Black Scorpion. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, this drove me nuts because the fucking Street Profits kept <clears throat> kept pointing to a crowd that wasn't there and nodding affirmatively. Like you're another, <laughs> you're another bunch of idiots who, and like I can't they tell if like smoke. they were trying to be ironic smoke. or you're just morons. Either way, it didn't work. Yeah. Um. They all do, you know, high speed, dynamic flippity doos. Um, Angelo Dawkins is a good, you know, is a good heavy, uh, a good solid heavy guy wrestler. You know, he has Montez Ford who does all the high spots and everything. They work really, really well together. Garza and Theory were there for them. It was fine. The best part about this was Bianca Belair coming in and delivering a beating to uh, Zelina Vega. <clears throat> yep. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just upset my boy Angel Garza didn't win. No, of course. Well, you got. I mean, right after this match was over, you had uh, Titus O'Neil standing up there on the perch, and uh, he's talking about uh, Gronk leaving the venue with the twenty four seven title. Of course, That's my prediction, right. my prediction for next year <laughs> was uh, an elimination chamber between Brock Lesnar, Goldberg, Cain Velasquez, Tito Ortiz, Tyson Fury, and Gronk for the world title. <laughs> Eighty seven stars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the stars. It's going to be amazing when 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 and when Gronk wins and Gronkomania runs wild on you, WWE. Oh. It's going to be uh, straight to the moon. I don't, I don't know if their, there's. Their Glenn I don't know if there's. I don't know if there's been a more annoying WrestleMania host in the history of WrestleMania, but the Gronk. I mean, everything about him makes me want to grab him and like drive nails in his face or something. I don't know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, leave Gronk alone. He's a party boy. Oh. He's with he's with the W. He's the champion we need right now in these trying times. He looks like he needs the um, the Spirit Squad with him. I don't know what it is. He looks like Kenny Dykstra. Yeah, he does. Yeah, they should have had him go over Goldberg. Instead oh my of, god! That's not the, you know that's not the worst idea. 
That's not the worst idea. <laughs> no, they, you know what? It's not. But they could have done it where, like, they do the uh, the Hitman bit from WCW, where you know they ring the bell, Goldberg goes to spear him, and he falls over. He's dead. wearing the medal. Yep. Yeah, and Gronk's like, "Gaga, I learned from watching Bret Hart, bitch." And then he just pins him <laughs> and like runs away with the title. Yee! And then him and Mojo rally butt chests and celebrate. Yes. Spike the belt. <laughs> be fantastic. That's right. actually better than what we got. Yeah. All right. So the Fatal Five way for the Women's Championship. This was all about the teasing of the Becky Sasha Banks thing. Um, I actually like the way this started because everyone ganged up on Tamita. But then they all, have AD, they all got the ADD and they didn't stay on Tamina. Um, eventually, they, they got her out of there. Uh, uh, moving along, there's a spot where Bailey hits Sasha, and Sasha's like, what the fuck? And she's like, I'm sorry. And then L- Lacey goes to hit her, and she like tries to push her out of the way, but she ends up catching a like a rebound shot and getting knocked on her ass. Uh, and Yeah, she got the, the woman's right by Lacey, yep, and got knocked out. Um... And Bailey was a little too uh, slow, slow in quotes, to stop the pin. And so eventually Bailey was able to win the match when Sasha ran back out again and gave her the assist to win uh, when she finally defeated Lacey Evans at 19 minutes and 20 seconds. Um, this is one of the best matches on the card, really, between the it two. It was. Nights. Yep. This was, this. I mean, um, in my preview with Larry, I was like, Gosh, I hope somebody is in charge of this fuck show because Bailey has been in some clunkers. Lacey Evans needs time to cook. Naomi can work. Sasha can work, but she's a dainty little thing who gets injured constantly. You know, if the wind blows the wrong way. And then, you know, you have Tamina, <laughs> who's 900 years old and built like a fucking tank. So <laughs> this this had all the makings of a terrible match. But against all odds, it was one of the best ones on the best ones on the night. What do you think, Sheehan? And Metal, yep. Oh, I I thought the match was good. I'm just so tired of the Bailey Sasha story. It uh, I think they need time away from one another because this is this on again off again thing that we're just constantly getting with them. The you know the accidental hit and the the just the the comeback with Sasha being like you know what the hell? It's like come on, this is a this is a huge cluster of a match. You you're gonna get hit. So it's. <laughs> It just felt very, very manufactured. The the feud that will come out of this eventually, when one of them turns on the other, I, I think nobody's going to care because it's it's going to. We've been playing with this damn feud for years now at this point, and uh, the match itself was fine. I, I'm I'm actually glad Bailey walked out with the belt still, but uh, really tired of her and Sasha's uh, on again, off again crap. She in? No, fuck Bailey. The other one. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, so well, I like I like I said I like the Tamina spot at the beginning where everybody piled on her and eliminated. Uh, Naomi's exit was the funniest because you had uh, Bailey and Sasha gang up like two mean girls at the end and they smiled and congratulated each other and Bailey actually told <laughs> Naomi, "Hey, go dance to the back." I was like, "Yes, there you go." And I love it. But uh, yeah, I think um, I think uh, having Lacey. Uh oh, Mark is dead. You okay? I'm I'm good. Keep going. All right. So, you know, the whole Bailey Sasha thing is being played out a little bit too long, but I like the way they keep pulling it back. So, just when you think they're going to have dissension, she comes out and helps her out at the end. And, uh, you know, all is well with the rockers. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but I don't know. I don't know where you go. Do you, do you put Sasha as a face, which is always a mistake? I yeah. mean, Bailey, Bailey is basically irredeemable. Nobody gives a crap about her. They hate her guts as a face and like X-Pac style heat. So you can't really turn her face again right away under current circumstances. And Sasha just doesn't work as a face. So you're sort of stuck in a rock and a hard place. The, these, the, these guys are going to be uh, best friends forever, similar to uh, Nikki Cross and, uh, and uh, oh, my God, Alexa Bliss. All right. Now we come to it. Oh no! Don't say it. The match that split the internet. The can fiend. I just say that you you were right all along about the fiend, Mark? Can I just can I go on record and just say uh, I remember when I was praising the fiend in his debut and he was everything I thought he was. Well, I was wrong. You're right. I give up. <laughs> well said. Um, 
All right, so this match, one, only works if you're not, like, hell-bent on seeing these two wrestle, which I'm not. I don't think anybody wanted to see these two wrestle. No. So they did an angle instead of a match, and I thought the angle was great because it was like, this is your life, John so Cena, much basically. In, and, in parts, it was great. And the, here's the thing, like... Stylistically, you can kind of point at certain things and be like, oh, I don't know if they should have done this or that. But overall, they told the story where basically <clears throat> it's a lot of what people have criticized John Cena for. And that's what I liked about it. And that, you know, credit in the, all the credit in the world of John Cena, who stood up to that criticism and just let it happen. Oh, yeah. 100%. You know, like he didn't have to go for any of that. But I, you know, but I have to say, like, for him to basically be called out as a bully, be called out as a guy who buries people, you know, be called out as a guy who, you know, is basically like a villain in the backstage. I was like, wow, you know, because what we know of him is, oh, he's just, he's the Make a Wish guy, you know, he's on Nickelodeon, he's good with kids, blah 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 blah. But there's this other side to him. And they brought it to light, and they had a lot of fun with it. And I thought, like, Bray Wyatt, as his Mr. Rogers character, was a great character to draw that out. And then, you know, then the Fiend comes in, boom, Sister Abigail, Mandible Claw, we're done. I'm like, okay. I didn't want to see the Fat Juggalo versus Big Match Cena. Hmm. Um, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't either. And so if you're not going to do that, and you have this empty arena situation... <clears throat> why not do something like this and like I'll accept that for some people this might have been a little too like ethereal a little too esoteric but I was laughing my ass off at this I was having a great time and I liked you know I liked the genuine criticism of John Cena and him taking it like a man so I had no problem with this match it's one of my favorites of the weekend this this is actually a best served as a raw segment as a this is your life segment like you said I think this is this was wrong to place this as a match because I think you you didn't get it so with Undertaker AJ you actually got a cinematic match and you know it it took care of the entire feud like it it had a purpose this was a segment this was not a match this was not much of anything however when you look at the parts and pieces of this thing, there's a lot of genius going on here. You know what I mean? I mean, you had... Let's see what we had here. So, um, I mean, you had the callbacks to Saturday night's main event. You had Macho Mercy and McBoss Man there on the, uh, on the commentary, which was genius. You had NWO Cena, which I think back in the day, can you imagine John Cena as like an NWO-style heel? It would have been amazing. You brought back... Um, you know, Miss Doctor Thugonomics. I mean, you you had all eras of of Cena, and uh, my only criticism with it is it, it wasn't a match. Number one, so it, it was a mistake to play it out as a match. But as a segment, I think it was a, it was definitely a win. Uh, one particular scene when uh, when I was watching this show, and you know, one of my family walks by and they see John Cena beating on a puppet. They're like, <laughs> "Oh my God, what are you watching?" What well, are you watching? And I, 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 and I honestly had to on. say, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> he thought he was beating on Bray Wyatt. And then, see, like I said, there's like tons of symbolism in this. I, I, look, I get that <clears throat> people don't want to do like interpretive literature in their wrestling. But that's what a lot of this was. There was like tons of symbolism here. There was tons of... Um, there was uh, there was there was a lot of callbacks. Like yeah, they had classic There's... Bray Wyatt. They had Bray as Eric Bischoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a ton of great stuff. By the way, had John Cena like you know gotten through all this and then won, I'd take back everything I would have just said. <laughs> he had to lose this. So oh, he did. Yes. Somebody and boy, is he is he looking more like Ernest every day? <laughs> Somebody uh, in one of the chats that I'm in was like. Is this not like the perfect send off for John Cena? I'm like, it really is. Like, there's no better way to do this. It is. Yeah, I agree. Mm hmm. Sheehan? I hated the fact that this didn't go on an hour. Um, <laughs> I thought this. 
I thought this was just so much fun. Oh, man, it scratched me everywhere I itched. I love the callbacks. Um, I, I loved... Uh, the the NWO thing was awesome because it just it feels like you know Cena as that second coming of Hogan they had him on the Saturday Night's main event as in a Hogan is Hogan esque characterization and then as this you know as the the hated heel with the uh, with the spray painted belt who holds everybody down oh man it was awesome um, I, I liked I liked the fact that we finally got someone calling Bray Wyatt Husky Harris uh, even though you know we all know it they <laughs> chanted it at him his first night in. But just the fact that it's like, okay, well, we can see that, you know, he is messed up. This dude has been messed up throughout these years, and he places a lot of that uh, on Cena's shoulders here. And uh, I, I just thought this was wonderful. Um, because, I like like you, I did not want to see the fat juggalo fighting, you know, Ernest P. Worrell at WrestleMania. <laughs> I didn't need to see that. Uh, I marked out for the uh, for the SmackDown Fist showing up. I thought that was cool. Um just uh, just a hell of a good time here. Uh, I know we went into this match expecting a little hocus pocus. That was what the reports were telling us. And uh, oh, I thought this was just a blast. And if we never see John Cena again, which, which we will, if we never see him again, this is the good way to do it. Uh, I don't know what they do with the fiend moving forward. I don't know if this is vindication for him or or what. But uh, I'm actually uh, I was actually entertained, and I'm interested to see what what falls out of this one. Do you think that there's room for the to put the belt back on the fiend? What do you think? Sure. Well, who's champion say, now? Uh, Braun Strowman. Why don't you just torture yeah. Braun for a while? Why not? Yeah. Actually, not a terrible idea. Think about yeah. this. Just think history. about this. That's exactly what I was going to say. Wyatt family yeah. members. Mm-hmm. That's genius, actually. All right. Last match, and we will call on a night. Drew McIntyre gets his WrestleMania moment in an empty gym against Brock Lesnar, who didn't want to be there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> he don't want the COVID, Mark. He don't want the COVID. Uh, less than five minutes. Spam finishers. Yep. Drew, Drew wins. Guys, go ahead. I think, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I wish Michael Cole called this entire show. Um, Tom Phillips and Byron Saxon. They, it was a tough, it was a tough sell to begin with, with the empty arena and the setting. But they did not sell this moment as any. This was this was Matt Stryker saying it's Christian when he walked out on ECW after being gone for five years. You know, this was not uh, exactly. It did, yeah, it just felt so canned, so dead. It just it drew attention to the fact that this was canned <laughs> and dead. Um, Michael Cole, warts and all, could have called this better. Uh, the match itself, um, the match itself was like you said, finisher spam, which is, I guess it is what it is. Uh, I thought Heyman did his job as well as he could have in the situation he was in, um, and I was happy to see Drew win. Man, like for our listeners out there, can I get a show of hands on who hates the Claymore <laughs> kick? Yep, every single one of you got your hands up. Exactly, oh, I love it. No, you do not. Liar. I, do. You, I think you, it's you, a cool you, move. <laughs> you lie out of your face, false prophet. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a good move. I don't care. It's just a, like a a walking kick. <laughs> and he beats people. He beats like big people like Brock Lesnar with it. I just I just don't get it. But anyway. Be the 18th uh, person doing a spear on the show. <laughs> oh, well, this is true. This is true. <laughs> But uh, I think poor Drew McIntyre, boy, did he suffer with having no audience here for winning his title. It almost seems like he, it, it almost looked at the end of it like he wanted to throw it in the garbage. It, he looked, <laughs> do, you, do you think there was a part disgust with him that he he didn't get his moment? Like you can almost feel it. It almost vibed off him. It did. It totally did. It's And he was he was down on his knees. He was doing his, uh, you know, his little pose. And then he the got on the rope. Boyhood dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God! Listen, we're gonna have to do uh, a WrestleMania watch along, and I want you to do the uh, the Shawn Michaels Bret Hart match, and I want you to do the commentary on that one. That was classic. <laughs> the most flamboyant. So Mark yeah. hasn't seen the ending, the actual ending to this pay per view. Yokozuna so, Hulk Hogan match. Yeah. So what? What don't you tell him the real ending of what happened? Okay, so Drew McIntyre wins the belt against Brock, right? He goes to the back, he takes a bath, he he dries himself off. He gets his nameplate put on the side of the belt, and he comes out to give an interview. And he's giving an interview with random blonde robot number three. 
and uh, whose music <laughs> should hit? Them about three. Yes, and whose music should hit? But well, well it's the big show. It's the big <laughs> show. Oh yeah, the, the Wikipedia actually says that like that was a dark match. <laughs> well, they they uh, they they played this up like it was. I, you know, when I was watching Raw this morning, I because I, uh, I, I I don't watch it live. I try to fast forward through as much of it as I can. So I I was actually like, oh crap, they're taking the belt off of Drew the same night. That they're doing uh they're doing the Yokozuna thing here, and. Uh, well, that didn't quite happen that way. Uh, Drew did manage to uh, defeat Slay the Giant, but uh, but the funny thing was, we have Byron Saxon sitting there, and he goes, "the the guy who just won the belt at WrestleMania is being challenged right away. I've never seen this before." God, oh, oh, oh. okay. You shitting me, pal? You, you, you like didn't see WrestleMania in the bank Nine? Cash in? Fucking, are you kidding me? <laughs> WrestleMania like, Nine's another good one. I... Yeah, it's what a disaster. But uh, but yeah, I was really scared they were going to put the belt on a show because he's got that Netflix thing going on now, and he's probably going to be doing talk shows when talk shows become a thing that happens again. Um, but uh, but alas, it did not go that way. All right. So overall, it's it's like hard to even rate these. I think uh, I read like like an aggregate score for this was like a B minus. Um, there's some good. There's some bad. There's some ugly. Uh, it's kind of a thumbs in the middle show for me, you know. Uh, a middle grade is a C. I really, you know, at best maybe a C plus because they were, you know, there was some stuff that really raised the bar, but then there was some stuff that was so bad it should be studied. Um, <clears throat> we talked at the beginning about you know what do you do? You know, you've built up these matches. You you need you know if you're gonna. And this is what I was getting at at the top of the show, Sheehan. If hmm. you're going to cancel, then what do you do with the TV time that you have to produce? And at this point, you know, WrestleMania felt like a natural stopping point. Because going forward, they can the slate is clean. They can do whatever they want. <clears throat> Most of these matches they've been building up since at least January. So, what, you know, it's like they did it. It's done. Now... You know, allegedly there's going to be... I've heard two theories about Money in the Bank next month. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen, but I've, <laughs> I've been wrong before. We're going to put a ladder in the Performance Center, and you nine motherfuckers are going to fall off of it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> but, only, but only one at a time. Yeah. So uh, give your final thoughts there, guys, and then we'll wrap up. See you um, I, I think thumbs in the middle is probably as good as we'll go with this one. Uh, there was a, there was plenty of good here. There was plenty of earnest, and and I'm not talking about John Cena's face, but uh, there was earnest uh, <laughs> attempts at entertainment here. Uh, there was also a lot of shit. There was a lot of garbage on here too. Uh, I don't really see why we needed to do the two nights. There was a lot of filler here that we could have pushed off, or there was filler we could have pushed off that might have made the uh, the subsequent TV tapings a little bit more special like they're doing with the NXT instead of doing a takeover they're putting the show the, the matches on the actual program I mean they could have done the five way women's match on Smackdown they, they could have done I, I don't know why they did the Aleister Black Bobby Lashley match uh, I, I, I didn't even know they were feuding I didn't know they met you know but uh, we had it on, on Wrestlemania and then we had oh, we didn't have it last night that was Apollo Crews but uh, it was just <laughs> I, I didn't mean it that way, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you did. <laughs> no, no, but uh, I, I don't know why that match happened at WrestleMania. It didn't feel like a WrestleMania caliber match. Um, Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn could have been a SmackDown match. Seth Rollins, Owens could have been a Raw match. We only really needed the uh, the AJ and uh, and Undertaker match. Could have done the Cena Wyatt, uh, you know, uh, show and. Uh, and then maybe the two uh, the two women matches, the two women title matches, and the uh, the two uh, the two heavyweight title matches, and or not even both of them. Get rid of Strowman match, just do the uh, the Drew match. Didn't need the two nights. It felt because what was it in total? About seven hours? Was it three the first night, four the second? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was, mean, yeah. I mean, seven hours. That is a slog. I don't know how they're going to package it on the network. I don't know if it'll be in two parts or if they'll combine it into into one. It's if two parts do, right now. Okay. Uh, 
I just hope, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, they should offer a second feed for it where they do pipe in crowd noise just to make it a little bit more bearable to get through. They could sync it up, make it sound exactly how they want it to sound. You can choose to watch the the silent one or you can choose to watch the the crowd pop one and uh, and have your fun either way. Take me home, Bailey. Well, sir, to me, this was a little bit above, uh, well, it, it was way above my expectations. So I was vocal about wanting to cancel this thing. Um, you know, if you didn't have the crowd, I thought it was just going to completely remove any sense of, uh, of a WrestleMania. But you know what? There were parts of this that I felt were genius, that they hit on all cylinders, that was better than it had any right to be. And there was stuff that uh, had no right to be that bad, such as Edge and Orton. <laughs> it was just, there was some really bad stuff, and I mean poor poor McIntyre. So I think in the end, I think uh, once the world settles down, we we have to do a little bit of a a replay, a WrestleMania rewind of sorts, and uh, I think we need to make up some grounds and we need to do some redos in front of a live crowd to really really. Uh, you know, bring back some of these moments that we lost here because I think uh, McIntyre really lost a lot just winning the title in front of a uh, in front of no crowd. You know what I mean? There was so much there. Edge and Edge and Orton they need a rematch in front of a crowd. Um, we don't need to see Cena or any of the women or the Street Profits bringing the smoke anymore. <laughs> but uh, I I would have loved to have seen Otis and and Mandy get together in front of a crowd. I think there's there's a lot of emotion that was missed out of this. But overall, I'm going to give WrestleMania a pass because I think it uh, I think it it overachieved for uh, what it was set up to be, and I think it was uh, destined to be a failure. But I think they pulled off something salvageable. So I will give a thumbs up. All right, quick, Sheehan, do your plugs. I know you got a big show that you just released, so you can tell the people all about it. Certainly, it's certainly. longer if, than WrestleMania. It's longer. It's longer than WrestleMania. It is. It actually is longer than WrestleMania. If uh, you're a fan of the early '90s or just the '90s X-Men comics, uh, we launched a show called From Claremont to Claremont, an X-Men podcast, which covers. It's hopefully going to be monthly, and it will cover an entire month's worth of X-Men books. So uh, it's about eight or nine books at the moment. Uh, that will probably go up to about I don't know a dozen and a half by the time we hit the mid '90s, but. Uh, the first episode is nine hours and fifty four minutes long, so uh, it's it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of segments. Uh, Mr. Bailey is a is a co host on one of the segments. We had a great time talking about X Force. Uh, it's a a lot of fun. I I, I encourage people to uh, check it out if you have the space on your mobile device. Um, I'm also doing uh, Chris is on Infinite Earth still daily blog posts discussing DC Comics every single day at Chris is on Infinite Earths dot com. Uh, you can find that other show at Chris and Reggie dot com, Chris and Reggie dot Podbean dot com, and also at Nineties X Men dot com. Oh, and I'm on Twitter at Ace Comics. All right, Bailey. All right. What do you got going on? All right, on? you can find. You can find me over at uh, on the Twitter at Charlton underscore Hero, as well. You can find myself and Mr. Chris Sheehan on Moratory Mondays every yes. single Monday. We're right in the middle of season two right now. We have three episodes uh, that have already been put up on season two. So if you're in the Strike Force Moratory like we are. Uh, come on in, enjoy the ride. We are almost halfway through the uh, the 32 issue run, and uh, we're about to go um, from the heights of the mountain of uh, of great book <laughs> to the the depths of absolute despair with Mark Bagley and uh, some of the worst <laughs> art and story you're ever going to see to cap off a series so good. So, yep. So you can find me there and uh, listen. I podcast from time to time, but I uh, I bow to the two men that I that I'm podcasting with tonight because uh, you know I, uh, I I do not even come close to the work that the both these guys put out. So <laughs> listen to Mr. Sheehan, listen to Mr. Radlich. These guys know what they're doing. Yeah, when one Thank of us you. isn't coughing our brains out. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> so before another coughing fit overtakes me, thank you for joining us on TV Party tonight. And our review of WrestleMania 36 for the Podsman. Be well, be safe, and behave.